Miami is known as a wonderful place for relaxation and good times. But don't expect too much of that today. Coming off a contact-filled event at Barber Motorsports Park, Grand Am Rolex Series competitors come to the Homestead Miami Speedway. And it could be payback time at a place that's known to have action as hot as the weather. Unlike NASCAR, a series champion will not be crowned today, but we could have our third different winner in as many races this year. The Art of Racing in the Rain. It's the title of a New York Times best-selling book, but it's also what the drivers will be aiming to master today here in Southern Florida. Being savvy and smart will be paramount if you want to get to victory lane today in the Grand Prix of Miami, round three of the Grand Am Rolex Sports Car Series. 30 years ago, the very first Grand Prix of Miami ran on the streets of downtown, and coincidentally, that was also wet. Yes, you'll hear us talking a lot about the weather today. Unfortunately, the radar picture has looked like that for the best part of 24 hours. Very, very trying conditions. You hear us talk a lot about paddle shifts. We might just be talking about paddles today here in Miami. Hi, folks. Lee Diffie along with Calvin Fish and Dorsey Schrader. And the big thing to remember here, you might be able to hear and see the cars rolling off behind us. Sports cars do race in the rain. They do, Lee, but it's going to be a long, tough afternoon for these drivers. The track condition will change by the minute. They're going to be on their toes. But I think the bigger factor is how these teams prepared these race cars. Remember for the Daytona prototypes, this is the new Gen 3 DP. So they haven't run in race conditions like this. Lot of answers unanswered questions right now and because of the 20 degree banking here at homestead this is a track known for the track that puts the most load into the tire now they've never raced here in the rain before and that rain tire has never seen these kind of loads we'll find out very shortly how that goes patience 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 for sure we encourage you to join the conversation via twitter it is hashtag ga on speed and we look forward to hearing your observations and thoughts because it's certainly going to be a very interesting day right now let's get you to this weekend's daytona prototype storylines after all the hard work designing and building an all-new corvette daytona prototype which made its debut only last november the spirit of daytona team delivered a feel-good victory with it at barber in only the car's second race but it was another Corvette, Max Angelelli's SunTrust machine, which literally made its presence felt at Barber in two separate incidents. One of which many thought was a dirty move on the Action Express Corvette driven by Darren Law. Will we see retaliation today? The DP points leader is Peter Barron's number eight Starworks Ford Riley, driven by Ryan Dial and Enzo Podolicchio. What about defending series champs, the 01 Ganassi team? Well, after problems at both Daytona and Barber, they currently sit an uncharacteristic fourth in points. Today, they'll try to end a five-race winless streak. Well, today is not the only day we have had bad weather here at Homestead Miami Speedway. We had a monsoon yesterday. In fact, it canceled qualifying, so they will start today based on points. That's good news for the number eight Starworks entry, Enzo Padalico and Ryan DL. They'll start from the pole alongside John Pugh in his Mike Shank Racing Daytona prototype. But for other teams who have struggled this year, like SunTrust Racing, who had a dismal Rolex 24, that means they'll have to start well back in the order. And that is a long way to go today to get to the front under some dismal weather conditions. Now let's check in with the GT storylines. Sylvain Tremblay and Jonathan Bomarito in the number 70 Mazda use speed and strategy to take the GT class victory at Barber by a large margin over their nearest competitor. That was the number 69 FXDD Ferrari 458, which finished second in the hands of pro driver Jeff Siegel and his pro am partner Emil Asentado, who had a great race. The highest placed Audi R8 was the number 51 APR machine piloted by Jim Norman and Dian Van Molka, which at one point was second before finishing 11th. The number 44 Magnus Porsche of Andy Lally and John Potter continues to lead the points on the strength of its Rolex 24 win, as well as a hotly contested fourth place finish at Barber. Well, Lee, with the depth of manufacturer diversity in GT, we could see the third different manufacturer win in as many races, especially with extreme speed motorsports bringing their very fast Ferrari back into the series. But with some of these manufacturers being new, the Ferrari and the Audi, this will be the first time these teams have seen wet conditions. And all of these drivers will tell you that the biggest challenge of driving in the rain is visibility through the windscreen. After this morning's practice, a lot of teams still scrambling to address those issues. But at this point in time, the last option might be the oldest option, a rag on a stick. Very true, Chris, very true, and we have seen that before, haven't we? Not for quite some time, 
but uh, we will see how this one plays out. Starting grid will roll through at the top of your screen. We do have some onboards to show you as well, and the pictures are going to be very, very interesting. David Donoghue here at the uh, conclusion of the drivers' meeting uh, said to us not that long ago, hey, did you guys uh, have any onboards on during this morning's practice session? He said, I thought I was floating. So uh, it's been very trying conditions here. Max Angelelli will take the helm of the SunTrust uh, Corvette for the first time in a long time, actually. Yeah, there's a little switch up there on the SunTrust team. They're going to alternate Ricky and Max in terms of who starts the race, so even though Max didn't get to get the qualifying run in, he was already designated as the starting driver here today. Switching up from uh, DP to GT. And that is the helmet of Tom Long. Tom is filling in for Hollywood actor Patrick Dempsey, who is uh, filming an episode of Grey's Anatomy this weekend. And he's pretty frustrated not to be here, but work calls first before fun. So Tom is filling in. Miguel Asentado, what a run he had at Barber Dorsey. Really showed us a good drive there. We expect a lot of them here, but in the rain, a lot today. Remember, we asked you to join in the conversation on Twitter, hashtag GA on speed. Well, a uh, multi-time series champion and reigning NASCAR Sprint Cup Rookie of the Year. Andy Lally tweeted this just a few moments ago. This is either going to be an epic event of awesomeness or an epic event of disaster. We hope the initial, Andy, that's for sure. And as you can see behind the Nissan GTR pace car, the field running very slowly and the managing director of racing operations, Mark Raffoff, has said to the guys, we will be starting under caution. Darren Law says, we added a rudder to the car. We need to go boat racing today. I agree with him. The rudder would be very effective to get down in turn one. If you have an eagle eye, you may have seen a green flag fly. So the race has actually begun. Stand by. This is smart. You know, what they're doing right now, they're putting the car behind the pace car, no passing. They're going to have the drivers take a look at the puddles that are on the racetrack. There's nowhere for this water to go. We're in Florida. It's been raining like crazy for days, two days, like you saw Darren Law say. So there are going to be puddles that have to be dealt with. The drivers are going to get a first-hand look at it before it really goes crazy. Of course, once they go to full throttle, these cars are going to throw a huge rooster tail of strike out. Visibility, nothing. Yeah, good point, Dorsey. And uh, in the drivers meeting, Mark Graffo said essentially what I'd like to see is a single file at the start because going down through turn one, that's one of the areas of the deepest water. I don't want you guys trying to go side by side through there. We're probably going to have an incident. And what he also allowed is the drivers to actually get out of line. Normally in Grand Am competition, Mark Raffoff doesn't want to see the drivers pulling out of line. He said, I'll allow you to do that today for the sake of good visibility at the start. So you're running up on the old vents, 20 degrees at the top. It's progressive over. It's 12 degrees down by the But the water runs downhill, so all that water runs down off of banking right into turn one's brake zone. Makes this very difficult. That's probably the most dangerous place on the road. One of the key things to come out of uh, this morning's drivers meeting with Mark Raffoff was a lot of flexibility. Just if you guys proceed with caution, I'll give you quite a bit of rope. Just be mindful and respectful of each other. I will let you pull out like Cal mentioned, and, and, but it's all in the name of safety. We want to put on a good show. We want to have a race, but we want you and your equipment to be safe first and foremost. Brian? Hey guys, I'm standing down at the transition from the banking to the road course that Dorsey was just talking about. That is where the water collects. Interesting, it's already come back from when the field came through behind the pace car. It kind of knocked it out of the way made a little bit of a line that was somewhat clear, but as soon as the field left away, the water is coming back, and that's what they're gonna have to deal with all day long. We get one of those heavy downpours, this whole area down here will fill up with an inch or two of water. Remember guys, you got two pro-amp drivers leading this field to green. Enzo Quadalicu, John Pugh, a lot of pressure on those drivers. We've seen them take victory this year, but, you know, this is a tough one. So, to reiterate Brian's point earlier, qualifying was rained out yesterday. That's why they're starting in this order, in championship point order. Enzo Potalicchio at the front of this field ahead of John Pugh. Richard Westbrook, our most recent winner. Then the Ganassi car, the Telmex BMW. Watch Westbrook, he's from England. He's very experienced with these guys. The 90, I think, is going to go to the front. That's my guess. Yeah, but he's got to be careful. He's got to think about that championship. He's got such a strong car. You can't afford to throw it away here going for it too early. There he slides to the inside. That's the inside of John Pugh. He has the most experience, Calvin, in these kind of conditions. And I'd say he is the odds-on favorite at the beginning of this race to take that lead. One thing Westbrook does not have a lot of experience in, though, is prototype. Types. This is only his third race in a Daytona prototype. He did the Rolex 24. He won the last time out. Sorry, I take that back. It's his fourth. He did one for level five as well. He's a, he's a, a GT guy. He's a multi-time Porsche Super Cup champion. 
Daytona prototypes and prototype racing are new to him, but he has done a brilliant job so far. And this, this is really <laughs> tricky there. The spray is unbelievable. The tail's coming off these Daytona prototypes. They're just going to spread out as they go down to these brakes. So they just see the race running. Right up ahead, right here is where it gets very tricky. It's kind of an undulated brake surface, and water stands here. And then they make a, a hairpin left to go on the banking, and that water again comes off the bank right here. Watch Westbrook the for the lead. He looks to the inside. Oddly, he gets the power down a little bit earlier. A little bit of side by side here. John Fogarty was pretty anxious to get by Maymo Rojas as well. Keep your eye on this blue Corvette, number 90 for Spirit of Daytona Racing. Now on the banking, the closer to the wall you are, the drier the racetrack is. The most degree of banking's at that wall, 20 degrees. Also, the wall shelters the rain. Great job by Enzo Podolicchio, and this is a really impressive first lap for this Pro-Am driver who's really finding his feet. Inside, inside, Westbrook looks. This is what he did a lap ago. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Puddleikio got a little loose there. Good catch from the Venezuelan. That is the puddles we were talking about. You hit those puddles and you hide your plane, off the plane for just a few feet. You got to just be steady and be real careful right then until the car settles back down. These guys go at it at the front. Let's show you something that happened just momentarily. The nine. The Action Express machine, whoop, as simple as that. Nothing more than getting on the throttle a little bit too abruptly, and it's spun up the rear tire. This is going to turn one. Watch Enzo probably because he hits that water. It just grabs one side of the car. If you suddenly hit the water with just one side, rubbering straight on, it just grabs and slows that side of the car down. It just pulls you one way or the other. Oh, now how deep is it out here? The 88 is in the swamp. Jordan Taylor. Now they just try and keep it rolling stop you are yeah. done doing a good job right now keep those rear wheels spinning keep the full momentum he'll dig his way out of here and i mean dig. this is the young man who came runner up in the gt championship last year in this 88 auto house camaro jordan has done a terrific job keeping that momentum going and gets it back on the racing surface a great job there look at this battle towards the front this is Fogarty. the 99 red dragon he's got around john pew he's dropped to the fifth spot Surprisingly, uh, Fogarty down there by the apron, all the way down the bottom of the hill. Not where I would think I'd want to be if I were him. I, I think that top line is drier and, and a safer place to be. This place to be, though, Dorsey's out <laughs> front for Enzo Podolico. He's got the clearest view. The problem <laughs> is, for Westbrook, is, you know, you've got the visibility there, but also, does the driver you're trying to pass see you coming? You've seen nothing in those side view mirrors. Surprisingly, they don't have their headlights on right now, at least. You know, Podolico doesn't have the headlights on. And that's one way I would... I hope that somebody would see me coming. We saw the 88 Auto House machine go off track. Chris Neville, what happened? Well, I was just listening to Jordan Taylor on the radio, and he said, hey, guys, sorry, that was my mistake, my issue going off the racetrack. Everything's okay with the car. The team responded, Jordan, don't worry about it. we got a long race in front of you. Just keep it on the racetrack. And the caution is out. The rain is falling very hard, so obviously Grand Am wanting to slow everybody down because now, as you guys are saying, cars having to aquaplane at high speed, this is the time we're going to see that. We arrived at this racetrack at around 7.45 this morning, and the rain has not stopped all day. It's just been in varying strengths. Obviously, now is possibly about the second or third hardest downpour we have seen today, so it's been relentless. There are local flood warnings. These are really tough, trying, testing conditions. Speed's coverage of the Rolex Sports Car Series is presented on speed by Rolex, a crown for every achievement. Brought to you in part by Continental Tire, innovative technology, driving confidence. Well, we wish we had those kind of pictures. <laughs> the water right now. Water levels about the same. We welcome you back to Homestead Miami Speedway. This is the Grand Prix of Miami, and we are circulating at a very slow speed. We're under our first, or really our second full course caution. Uh, rain falling just too heavily, too much standing water at the moment. I'm going to show you, if you've never been here, just where in the world, where in Florida, we are at Homestead Miami Speedway. Doris, if you would. Well, we'll take a look from Google Earth. And here you see as we head down, look at the World Center of Speed, Daytona, way north of Miami, and of course the southern to the Miami is Homestead. A Robo, 20 degrees of banking at the top, 11 at the bottom. Infield here, it's 2.3 miles long with the oval and the road course combined. 11 corners in there, all underwater. 
Transitioning now to the Continental Tire keys to the race, and the three are a mop, bucket, and boots. No, um, it's preparation, and different teams prepare in very different ways for these conditions. And Cal, I really think the proof's always in the pudding, isn't it? It is, and some of these drivers will already be uh, working with us in terms of giving the radio communication back to the teams in terms of if they can see. That is number one. Quick thinking, you've got to look for those puddles. You've got to make smart decisions on the racetrack. Also, if we do start to dry out at all, when is that cutoff point? But the amount of rain we're seeing indoors, I think it's going to be wet the whole distance today. Yeah, you see the truck right there going through the deep puddles. Of course, it splashes off to the right side of the road, which is full of water already. So where's it going to go from there? Back to the racetrack. We said right at the top of the show, being smart and being savvy is one of the best ways here in these conditions to get to victory lane. One of the smartest, one of the savviest team leaders is Mike Johnson. He's with Chris Neville. Yeah, Lee, and I talked to you about that rag and a stick a lot of teams might need to use today. One team and well, a whole bunch of teams that might not need that is the Chevrolet teams. And, Mike, that's because Pratt & Miller developed a heated windscreen so you don't have those fogging issues. Can you tell us about that windscreen? Yeah, you might remember from the Pontiac days, we had a lot of fogging problems. I think New Jersey a few years ago, we actually changed windscreens in the middle of the race. And, you know, the drivers couldn't see or do anything. And you try so many different things in these cars from blowing air you try hot air cold air air conditioned air to just get the temperature difference the right way so that because there's so much heat and steam coming from the front of the engine there's really nothing you can do especially with the open windows so we finally gave up on all of these tricks that you could come up with and went to basically a heated windscreen and for those that have a, a glass windscreen at home it's very similar and the fact that it's got very little like wires in the middle of the screen. I mean, they're so small, you can't even see them. I mean, I, we put the screen on, and I'm like, why is the windscreen not on? They're like, oh, it's in there. You know, you got to get real close. So this is the first time we've really been able to test it, and it's working perfectly. So right now, we're pretty happy. You know, Ronnie had a little spin on that second lap. We're going to come in right before the 30-minute mark because we can to try to get some track position, get back up in front of everybody when they come in. But, you know, we still got the two best rain drivers in the field. We're pretty, really good. Now, a system like that, obviously electrical, is that going to put more load on the entire system, burning that battery down, especially at slow speed like this? It can. I mean, we just got to go with what we can do. We're talking about shutting off air conditioners and other stuff like that, but we're just trying to keep an eye on everything I mean you just don't know until you start running and you know the other things you got to fire back up we've actually had problems with so much rain that it's it's drowning out electronics in the bottom of the car it's shutting itself off or it's you know there's so much water that two wires here and here can actually get short-circuited so we're not the only ones with that problem it's it's gonna be it's gonna be a, a battle for everybody well the good thing is it looks like that heavy rain is starting to let up Brian Chris, visibility is part of that issue, but the other thing is traction. The teams will go to a softer spring combination on the car to allow the suspension to move. It all moves through the tires. These are the Continental tires the teams run in the dry. These are the slick tires. You end up with a large footprint grabbing a hold of that asphalt, but in the rain, they go to this rain tire. Not only is the rubber compound very soft, you can actually dig your fingernail into it. Also, these channels move the water away and keep the car from hydroplaning. The other thing a team does, they go for downforce. In a Daytona prototype, like the 01 from Ganassi, their Riley prototype, they could change a different nose with more of these louvers. The more louvers there are on the nose, the more front downforce this car will get. So a lot of different options these teams can have to get downforce. Myself today, I've changed my hair compound because I know it was going to be a wet one, guys. So circulating under yellow, but as Chris mentioned, the rain is easing. Let's cross our fingers. Hope we can see some green flag racing real soon. Huge night on Saturday, May 19th at 7 p.m. Eastern here on Speed Live. It's the NASCAR Sprint Cup All-Star Race. Now, you won't see weather conditions like we've got here today, but what you will see is an all-or-nothing million-dollar brawl. It is going to be brilliant. It is each and every year the NASCAR Sprint Cup All-Star Race. It's live here on Speed. It's a huge one for us. at Saturday, May 19th at 7 p.m. Eastern live. We're back and we are ready to go racing. Remember when we went to the break, I said, let's hope for racing, but we've got it right now. And a big congratulations to both our Pro-Am drivers in Daytona Prototype and GT because Enzo Potalicchio and John Potter have maintained the lead. You saw there Richard Westbrook ducked a little bit tighter to that turn one area, hit that big cut on nearly. It's like putting the brakes on, Dorsey. Yeah, you know, you do that enough, that hydraulic pressure coming into that grill opening will break something sooner or later. It happened, like you said, Calvin, because he was making a uh, defensive move trying to get underneath and back give up. Yeah, the SunTrust team has put the splitter on the front of the car when they hit the water for the first time in testing here yesterday. 
having a report, getting a report that the Turner number 94 spun with Paul Dallalana behind the wheel. Here's John Fogarty on the inside, ducking up the inside of the five of David Donahue. Problem with passing here is you have to go for that apex to the inside of the racetrack, and down there is where the water is. You just can't see your competitor. I mean, you'd think, okay, you can get through this corner side by side, but unless you've got a spot up in the grandstand, we've got a replay of that spin by the 94 car down in turn one. Look at that. That water just pulled it to the right. <laughs> yeah, you're just right. the car to the right-hand side. Right side tires got in the water, and it slowed them up, pulled the car hard right, and then they lose traction as soon as you get sideways. Nice job from the Salens RX-8 Mazda and also the FXDD Ferrari with Emil Asentano behind the wheel. As we said earlier, let's give some props to these Pro-Am drivers. Out in front, Potalikio is driving well beyond his years in sports car racing. And John Potter, who is also a Pro-Am driver, does not earn his living from professional sports car racing. He's still maintaining the lead in GT. Good stuff. We saw both of those drivers, typically when it rains here on the road course, guys hide in the garage. Both of those <laughs> teams were pounding around yesterday. They've got a good setup on the car. The drivers are now used to these conditions. You know, unusual. Normally, when a rain session happens, you look at the rest of the weekend. If it doesn't look like it's going to be wet, you don't go out in the rain session. We looked at this weekend and said, yeah, it's going to rain. You better go out there and learn how to drive the rain. You haven't been there before. A lot of these guys haven't done this. Car 70 is Sylvain Tremblay, the most recent winner in GT. That gave that speed source team a huge shot in the arm. Their headquarters is only one hour from here. This is their home race, and they're feeling pretty confident this weekend, Brian. Yeah, they, what they didn't want to see, though, Lee, was that heavy rain. They feel like the Porsches have the advantage with all the weight in the back of that Porsche power plant over that rear axle. The Porsches can really sit down and go. The Mazda, one of the lightest cars in the field. Now, you would think that that would be an advantage, and it is in the dry, but in the wet, you want some road-hugging weight to hold that car down. The Mazda just doesn't have it. On top of that, they've got very narrow tires on that little Mazda RX-8. So deep water, heavy rain, not particularly good for them. Essentially, what you're trying to do is not make the car float. By not making it float, the heavier you are, that helps push the tire down. The tread sipes themselves cut through the water, so that helps the car. A narrower tire is actually better in the rain than a fatter tire. We will see David Donahue slice his way back through this GT field. He must have had a moment because he's up the front there battling away. He hasn't made a pit stop, but now he's trying to recover some ground here to the DP leaders. And you'll see a lot of spins on the infield, a lot of guys going off getting off wide into the water and just going into the grass as possible. Let's go on board to number 40, Mazda for Dempsey Racing. Tom Long is doing the driving. Now, this is a visibility problem because our camera's iris, our lens is better, more able to see through than what the human eye is. He cannot see as much as you're looking at right now, which is not very good. Yeah, it's like the, oh, that's the leader of GT, the 44 oh, car, John Potter. A quick know. spin there. Keep it going, keep it going. Keep keep it going. We saw Jordan in. Taylor do it. Yeah, he's got it. Man. I relate it to, it's as dangerous as like having a shave with a very sharp razor without Sorry. turning on the defogger in your bathroom because I mean, <laughs> it is dangerous out there. I'm glad we stopped that. Oh, just see that, just like you said, Calvin, right side tires got pulled on and then it just sent him out there where you're not gonna get any good. Made life easy for Sylvain Tremblay, who inherited the lead. You saw the 59 of Andrew Davis duck through there to grab second as well. See, exit in turn one is always a nemesis down here. You come off that bank, you go through the puddle, you're on a flat area down there. And really, from the driver's standpoint, in the car with this reduced visibility, you can't see the outside of the road as much as you might think. We start to get into a rhythm now. You know, a few laps under their belt, we'll start to recognize where the problem areas are. We've also had a lot of running this weekend, as we've discussed before. So. It does become fun at this stage. Doesn't look like fun, but once you really identify the grip levels of the racetrack, which are changing constantly, but you get into a rhythm around here. See a mechanic on the inside doing something at the back. That probably indicates an electrical issue. A lot of the electronic boxes that run ignition, that run all the uh, ECU, it's called electronic control unit, the computer, if you will, are inside in that dash area somewhere. That was Joe Nonamaker who brought the Salem's Master RX-8 to pit road. Meanwhile, the race for the lead continues, and Starworks driver Enzo Podolicchio continues to lead Richard Westbrook. Great job. Yeah, these guys are in a league of their own in terms of lap times, running for nearly a couple of seconds faster than the rest of the DP field. Westbrook took half a second out of the lead on that last lap, but uh, Podolicchio, what a tremendous job. We 
see Enzo? It's going to be a very leading question. Where did you get so good in the wet? Have you done a lot of this in Venezuela? This is really heads up driving. We saw that 43 Salens car on pit lane. What's the story, Chris? Well, just like Mike Johnson from Stevenson Motorsports said, the rain plays havoc with the electronics in the car. That's the problem down here with the Nanomaker group, the Salens Mazda in pit lane. Joe, Nanomaker behind the wheel, the paddle shift. You can see the paddles on the steering wheel there for shifting up and shifting down in the transmission. That electronic system not working right now. So Joe Nanomaker not able to engage the next gear. That paddle shift system would really help you in these conditions, Dorsey. It allows you to keep both hands on the wheel all of the time and just work the paddles behind the steering wheel itself without going down to do a shift down in the center console. So that is a big advantage in the drive, but even bigger, I feel, in these wet conditions. Absolutely. But again, electronics control the whole darn thing. So if you have any kind of an issue with the ECU, that runs right through that, and uh, then you're dead in the water. Remember, Enzo Podolicchio and his teammate Ryan Dial not only lead this championship right now, they also lead the World Endurance Championship on the back of a brilliant victory at Sebring. They don't head off to Europe next week, so these boys and this team led by Peter Barron are really a team on a roll. It's a Ford-powered Riley that leads the way. Every prototype you see in this field are what's called Generation 3. It's the latest iteration of Daytona prototypes, whether it be a Corvette or a, uh, a Riley chassis car. It's Ford Power leading Corvette at the moment. Starworks over the Daytona Bay Spirit of Daytona. With Troy and Todd Fliss and that magical moment a month ago in Alabama at the Barber Motorsports Park Complex to get their first and long-awaited victory and that was celebrated wide and far. Troy told us he got some pretty interesting phone calls and texts of congratulations. And that man there, Andy Lally, is going for his 100th series podium. Oh, look at this. Here they're going. They're bumping at it. He is on the other side of the fence. No, 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 they got robbed. Yes, the sights and sounds of the Grand Am Rolex sports car series, and it continues here today, doesn't it, at Homestead Miami Speedway. Plenty of spins, there's been no flips. And look at this, Paul Dallalana with a great catch and has recovered well to climb up the field. We'll talk more about that in a moment. More recently, John Potter, who was leading at this stage of the race, just got a little wide, got grabbed by that water and turned around. So that brings you up to speed. And there has been a pass for the lead while we're away in the break. So persistence paid off for Richard Westbrook and Spirit of Daytona, although Westy goes a little wide now. Boy, you don't want to get, look at the puddles out there. And it's snatching away at the right side of the tire. Tires pulling it over. Good save right there, but you just can't afford to go off wide. We see it there. You see the twitch by Enzo Podolicchio. And he gets uh, out there, gets in that deep water, and Westy just pounces, slides it down to the inside for turn three. Great right move. That, you can see what happens if you go out there. You're going to really pay the penalty because you can't do anything. We hear that the 99 has an issue. It's a big issue, too. Right side. That's a fuel fire of some sort. It's out now. That's good. Temporary extinguished. Say that again. Oh, it's come out the tailpipe. It's got an engine problem. Yeah, copy that. I wonder whether they uh, take up the rats to a comp accommodate the cooler conditions there. You're not really running at high temps in these conditions, of course, so maybe too much tape or something, but uh, it hurt the right bank of the engine one way or another, because that was all oil that was no on the right yeah. exhaust pipe. No alarm. You see any tape on the grill. See, it's smoking real heavy. Get it here if you can. The team's giving John Fogarty instructions. He was engaged in a fight with Maymo Rojas. Let's hear from Rojas's teammate now. Here's Scott Pruitt. Scott Pruitt's been sitting down on, on the box up here watching what's going on. I know it was miserable this morning when you were out, at least with it being constant rain. Is that better for the drivers? It is, and I mean, if you look at it in a positive way, how exciting you don't get the opportunity to race in a full race in the rain. So all the fans here, I mean, you see all these huge rooster tails from a driver's standpoint, absolutely crazy. I had my family at home. But you gotta be on top of this game all the time. I mean, kids can't make it 
shakes, you're driving offline, you're driving through traffic, you're driving where you cannot see. So, I mean, it's actually kind of fun. You know, being here in Miami, we get some other drivers who live down here. I saw your Ganassi stable mate, Juan Pablo Montoya, here. And I've seen vehicles out on the racetrack clearing things off. Has he given you any jet driver advice? <laughs> <laughs> standpoint from the driver's standpoint for all the fans that are here watching it's quite a show definitely quite a show Lee. certainly is so far that's for sure and the telmex bmw riley of Mamo rojas is running third however the red dragon on bob stallings the team principal's birthday and has not gone their way got the engine off right now they've got the, the thing cut off they're taking a look at that right side they'll be looking for an oil leak of some sort something that flashed and fired that right side off the exhaust pipe. It wasn't coming through the exhaust pipe itself. It certainly was on the pipe that was burning. Chris Neville standing by. Chris, tell us more. Yeah, well, initially when you guys were talking about the flames coming out of the Red Dragon, uh, the team started talking to John Fogarty, and they told him that the flames had, had subsided, and John told the team that, hey, there's no alarms in here. Do we really need to come to pit lane? Right but now I'm hearing uh, that it sounds like some, uh, something is coming out of the right side, the right bank. It sounds like maybe an oil leak or something on the right side. So they just told John Fogarty, shut it off, boy. This is uh, not the way this team wanted to come back after a nice second-place finish at Barber. Let's show you a replay if you've just joined us as to what Chris was talking about a little earlier. Quite spectacular vision from the 99 Gainsco Bob Stallings Corvette. Yeah, right there you can see something on the right side. And I think from when he fired it up, yeah. you can see it was smoking out of the exhaust pipe. That's dumping oil right down the chamber, right into the exhaust, lighting it off, and uh, they got engine problems. Yeah, back to the garage. They got a new engineer on board. Carl Brandon left this team after Daytona. John Ward served a lot of time with uh, Alex Gooney's father, All-American Racing Team. A few years gone past. Has really transitioned very well into this team. Bob Spillings told me yesterday, I'm very happy with the group. We're performing well. This is a track we're uncomfortable with. We want to come out of here to tracks that we really like, but this is not the sort of day you want. He said, this is really a point damage control race for us. Come out of here with a bag full of points and move on to chasing after that championship. Uh, look at that one. I believe they're just getting ready to pack it up. Meanwhile, this is our race leader, Richard, uh, Richard Westbrook. You may notice the pink ribbons being displayed on all of the Daytona prototypes here today. That's in support of Su Susan G. Komen for the Cure Foundation. Uh, Grand Am is holding hands with that um, uh, cancer research organization, raising the awareness of breast cancer. And they will also be involved further in the Rolex Sports Car Series at the Global Barter 250. It's our next race at New Jersey Motorsports Park. So thanks to all the teams for displaying the pink ribbons and supporting the Susan G. Komen for the Cure Foundation. Spoke to Troy Fliss the other day, certainly is very excited about getting that first win. I said, how did you celebrate? He said, well, I had a, a day in the garden, so I was pulling weeds, and I went to my cell phone after a couple of hours and had literally dozens of uh, well done messages. So it's, it's a big moment for that team. I mean, they're a smaller team, but they've really come a long way in the last two years. Had so much pace last year, Dorsey. Should have won many races, not just one. Had a good car here, in fact, when Garcia and Oz Negri got together late in the event when they were charging through for a potential win. So they were way overdue. And I think with this team and driver lineup this year, uh, they're going to go a long way towards that championship they're hunting. Richard Westbrook right here in the 90, the leader, just radioed his crew and said, guys, this is totally undrivable. And he's leading, and he's yes. leading comfortably. So he's not under any pressure, and he's still finding it tough. Potalicchio is some two and a half, three seconds back. There he is. Angelelli has done a very good job in that SunTrust Corvette. Car number 10 started last on the grid, and Max the Axe has... Uh, really worked his way very effectively up through the field to be well it's still a long mark what long way back he's some 13 seconds behind our leader but to come from last to third in class is a pretty handy effort from the italian rojas then popov then borcella and then donahue is the order at the moment and the mighty mazda sylvain tremblay still leads gt over andrew davis and paul dalalana see you in a moment Quick reminder that speed brings you up. 
close and personal to all the racing from Homestead. You can stay informed with the latest Grand Am updates right from the track. Check out the latest news, photos, videos at speed.com and auto racing on speed on Facebook. It's the expanded coverage. We are back under yellow, and that is just because the rain has intensified even more following up on those recent comments from uh, Spirit of Daytona driver and race leader Richard Westbrook. It is the SunTrust Corvette that leads this string of cars onto pit road for this first round of stops. Yeah, a little surprising actually to see some of those cars stay out. We're past the 30 minute mark where the drivers would get championship points and the 10 cars in, I believe Ricky Taylor is at the ready. There you see him. Left side is really tight there with this car. Look at the refueling as the drivers are trying to make that change. A little bit tighter than the driver's side where the driver sits on the other side of the race car. Doubt you'll see any tire changes. One of the reasons for that is these rain tires don't wear as badly. Second theory to that is they have heat in them. You don't want to lose that heat. As long as they have heat, they have grip. Brian? Zero one is in. Memo Rojas has climbed out. Scott Brute will climb in. I'm noticing some blockers on the radiator opening on the zero one because it is a cooler day. You guys were talking about engine temperature a little while ago. Rain tires obviously going on. Brute will get in. One of the things he said about this car in practice this morning was they really had a chance to drive it in okay, really, we really wet conditions. Okay. A little slower stop than they wanted. One of the problems with the car was getting a lot of water inside the cockpit. His feet wet on the pedals. That's always an issue as a driver. You know, remember back in the early days when they went to the 24-hour race for the first time, Ganassi, they had massive problems in similar conditions, and they actually couldn't find a racetrack to really recreate the conditions. So whenever it rained in Indianapolis, Mike Hull, Timmy King would take the car, not literally those guys, to send the team down to this big open parking lot and just drive it around at 35 miles an hour, simulating heavy rain conditions and sealing up and really going through all of the issues that you may get with the fogging the windshield, water coming into the cockpit. View from the inside. First of all, Tom Long from Dempsey Racing running fifth in the Mazda. This is Emil Asentado who finished beautifully on the podium at Barber a month ago. Emil's in the top 10 in the GT class in his FXDD Ferrari as well. Let's hear from one of the Daytona prototype drivers. Here's Ryan Dial. Ryan Dial sharing his number eight with Enzo Potolicchio. Now, interesting, I saw the team car in. You guys elected to stay out. Why is that, Ryan? Well, we're just trying to, first of all, see what's going to happen with the weather here. I mean, uh, there's a chance that he might stop the race at some point and we want to have uh, track position so we're staying out but yeah, I also Enzo's done a great job so I kind of think why do we bring him in at this point so we, we opted to keep him out and I'm glad that they caused this yellow or they created this yellow because it was getting pretty bad at this point. Well we're all I think impressed with the job that Enzo is doing running really strong right now guys from the drop of the green. Chris? Well, Max Angelelli jumped out of the SunTrust machine just moments ago, and Max, I saw you jump on the radio immediately to talk to Ricky. Any type of information you can give him about the racetrack? Yeah, everything. Everything from the little things to the major, major thing to know, uh, to know where and why and uh, what to inspect. In this condition, you need to know everything. Now, are you talking puddles, streams, things like that? It's three days we're talking about today, and the rain and the where to go, and I showed it to him on the day, I showed it to him to this morning. I try all I can. Obviously, the way the rainings come is down right now. You can't race in this, but in the lighter conditions, is it just challenging or is it just incredibly, incredibly tough? Very, very difficult. Even when it's light rain, it's so difficult because the traffic, the speed, you can't see anything. You really can't see anything. Now, you made a good run up from last place because we didn't have qualifying. How did you work your way through the field so well? The car is good. I'm feeling good. You know, I. This it is, I would just hope to win a race as soon as possible for Corvette. Well, he did well, and we know Ricky Taylor's going to do well. Ricky had an incredible race in the rain last year at VIR. GT cars on pit road. You see the 94 Turner machine. Paul Dallalana did a stellar job to recover from that spin to be third, Dorse. Absolutely did a great job. You see, it didn't cost him that much. It was a, a 360, and in the <laughs> rain, it reduced speed anyway, so it didn't catch him much, but it caught him off guard. He didn't make a mistake twice. That's the good news. Yeah, he and Bill Orban have such a great record here at Homestead. Remember, they got the double victory here last year, won the Rolex GT class and the Continental Tire Sports Car Challenge GS division as well. So uh, happy memories here in Florida. You saw a stop from the race of the class leading car, the 70 Speed Source Mazda. Here's the FXDD Ferrari. Good job, Emil Asentado. Looks like there's been a driver change executed there. Jeff Siegel will climb on board the 458. One of two 458s. Here he is, graduate of the University of Where Miami. Knows this city and knows this track very, very well. Does Jeff Siegel and he and Emil have been victorious here, but in a Mazda a couple of years ago. 
far, hats off to the crews. We haven't seen a lot of the fogging issues that we uh, expected that we might be in this, the first race rain, rain race of the year. I think the key is, Dorsey, we had so many wet yeah. sessions prior to the race starting. I'm sure when they first went out here yesterday in these similar conditions, they were, had issues, but now they've worked their way through it. TRG boys go to work on the 67 for Steve Berthow, and that's Spencer Pumpelli climbing aboard. Spencer does very, very well in the wet. The multi-time Rolex 24 winner. He knows what testing and trying conditions are all about. Kevin Buckler told us this morning after the driver's meeting, he said, I've put my two Porsche on full wet setup, soften them up, change the rake, change everything on these race cars. They should be dialed in. I tell you what, Spencer Pumpelli is one of the best. He will get this car towards the front of the pack. Chris and Brian have told us about the challenges of keeping that screen clear and clean and not fogged up. Kevin Buckler also told us they don't have heated shields in these. So they've had to use a variety of methods to keep that clear for their drivers. And out they go. As we are now almost 45 minutes into our third round and race of the year, let's bring you up to date with some news and notes of the Grand Am Rolex Sports Car Series. And good news for Canadian driver Michael Valiente as he joins Spirit of Daytona for several races this yeah, year. Yeah, starts at New Jersey, he'll do Detroit, Ohio, and Montreal. There we see the Rolex 24-hour winner, Mike Shank racing at fielded at an entry for the Indy 500. He said, this weekend, though, is critical. I've got to get that engine supply issue sorted out. Talk around the paddock about the possibility of Austin, Texas, which excites me a great deal. I would love to see us run there. And Aston Martin, David on a prototype. There's a picture of such a car. Yeah, there was something on Autosport a little while ago. Haven't heard too much talk about it, though, but it would be cool. That's for sure. Thanks for your tweets. We've been reading some interesting ones. We'll talk about that when we come back. Speed's coverage of the Rolex Sports Car Series is presented on speed by Rolex, a crown for every achievement. Brought to you in part by Continental Tire, innovative technology, driving confidence. And by Honda, the really big sales event, real deals, big inventory, now at your Honda dealer. We're going to get tired of seeing those scenics, aren't we, by the end of the day? And <laughs> there here it is. is. There it is. Calvin, you remember this, don't you? Oh. <laughs> this evening, very well, Dorsey. You, you had a fishing pole. Yeah, no, I did have a fishing pole. With a a little aluminum fish. If that's the best way to get it done. If nothing else works, the squeegee, the mop and the squeegee, if you will, and you'll put that down somewhere alongside the seat, right about there, I'd say. Is, this where, we, is this where we say, don't try this at home? Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> Why are you going down the road? <laughs> Waving with one hand, pulling a gear and the... Uh, and, and the rag and tweeting the with the other and tweeting with the other watching a really cool boat race right now oh wait it's the rolex series racing in the rain exactly there hasn't been all that many sympathetic tweets coming through mind you i just got a text from aj armandinger saying thinking about you here in charlotte it's 87 and fine i'm heading out for golf thanks for that <laughs> aj and how about this is this is a more serious one uh, from uh, Jamie 88 fan and it says I thought it's a rule that all cars are supposed to have lights on in the rain No, it's not mandatory reading right out of the rule book right now during sessions in darkness at least one operating head tail and brake light is required so we're not in the dark even though it may feel like it for the drivers so it's not mandatory Mark Raffoff said in the drivers meeting this morning if you have headlights fixed up with your car use them but rain lights are not mandatory in the series right now I would want mine on just from the standpoint of I want someone to know that I'm there if I am in a competitive situation trying to make a pass. There was one funny tweet just a moment ago saying, these guys are false advertising. <laughs> Share a little sunshine. Visit Florida.com. Well, but but it's not totally true. If you go far enough north of Daytona, there's sunshine in there. <laughs> not right here. Sure. That is the 40 Mazda with Tom Long on board doing a good job. This is Darren Law in the five. Action Express Racing Corvette. And there's been some interesting uh, radio traffic. Let's have a listen from a few moments ago. Just so you know, David said the hardest spot on the track for him was right here in turn eight. He had trouble going back to throttle. That's where he spun out a little. He was running in map three, which is our rain map. So when we go green, we can go in map three. Now, that's a lot of good information right there, just given. The fact that turn eight's really bad, that helps Darren. Map three, let's explain that. That's the ECU, electronic control unit. It's got different settings for more power, less power, 
conservation for fuel, et cetera. This is a rain map that they're on in three. What that does, it brings the power on very progressively. When you put the throttle down, it gives it to you a little at a time. Doesn't want to spin the rear tires up. That's great information. That was working on his prior driver. So turn eight, watch out for that. Start on, start on map three. And that's the key. We talked to Max Angelelli, Chris did, about giving that information to Ricky Taylor, explaining where the problem areas are on the racetrack, how to handle them, maybe what gear to be in. Maybe take it in a gear taller so you're not generating that wheel spin as you accelerate off the turn. First car you see, the blue Corvette, number 90. That's Richard Westbrook. He's still behind the wheel. No driver change there, nor for car number eight. We heard from Ryan Dial, his teammate, Enzo Potalicchio, still behind the wheel. Great job from those guys. The SunTrust Corvette, driver change there. We saw it. Ricky Taylor's on board that car after taking over from Max Angelelli. And the next car, Wow Barbosa, has taken over from Terry Borchella. And considering Terry spun earlier in this race, that too is a good comeback to have Barbosa in fourth. Lucas Lua has taken over from Alex Popov in the second Starworks car. And this is the 31 wheel and Corvette, major visibility problems. Yeah, look at that. Uh, we talked about it. It's like not turning on your uh, fan in your bathroom in the morning. You just can't see anything. It's, a, it's impossible. The team will sell. Just take it back out there. But it, it's crazy. Chris it is there. It's crazy. Yeah, guys, and I'm I was right down now. with this team this morning after the practice, and Boris said got out of the car, and he was actually pretty upset because the team opted to not practice much yesterday, so they really didn't know what they had with the windshield, and he said, you know, guys, we just can't do that if we want to compete at this level. We have to be out on the race trip. We have to do what we have. Now we've only got a couple hours to get ready, and that windscreen is still a problem. And will remain a problem because there's no fix for it. Every two or three laps, it's going to be exactly what you just saw right there. Zero visibility. Uh, it won't fix itself. You got a hot engine up front and then water that creates steam and it just comes straight up on that windshield. And in sports car racing and any kind of racing, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Let's rewind the clock to the Grand Prix of Miami, 1983. Ralph Sanchez and Miami Motorsports set out to put Miami on the big time auto racing map. Drivers quickly realized they couldn't come close to the 200 mile an hour straightaway speeds they were accustomed to running. Danny Angaius learned that the hard way. While some drivers made pit stops seeking tires that would better grip the rain soaked streets, leader Al Holbert remained on track. After 27 laps, conditions had become so intolerable, the cars had to be flagged off the track. The rains continued, and as the few race fans who braved the downpour slogged to the exits, the race was declared over. Al Holbert, the winner. And our spotter and statistician, uh, Chuck Dressing and Rick Ratajak, they were there that year and just said it was absolutely crazy. And if you were hearing right, yes, that was the voice of our man, Dave Despain. Yeah, and I think Dave has taken a couple of weekends off. Bob Varsha fills in for him tonight, and I think our little midget Dorsey uh, here. The Aussie fills in next week. That should be entertaining. Oh, my. I'm going to have to call in on that one myself. <laughs> I've, I've asked them to put a couple of phone books on Dave's seat so I can uh, <laughs> at least see over the desk. Drama for the 93 here. It's going to be an ongoing story. Isn't it? Quick reminder tonight on Speed. As always, Speed Center with Adam Alexander at 7 p.m. Eastern. And then Bob Varsha will be filling in tonight for Dave to Spain, who is uh, down in Mexico on assignment. He's having a little fun. And uh, that is a little later tonight, of course. We look forward to that. All right, let's get some updates from the pits. Here we go. It's all been happening down there. Well, Lee, one, of the, one of the things that I noticed was that uh, Miller Towing Service was running 1-2-3 a little while ago <laughs> under full course caution. While well, they were trying to clean the racetrack off, but the 44 came in, your championship leaders in the GT class. John Potter out. Andy Lally had climbed in. Lally looking for his 100th podium in Grand Am racing this weekend. So if he could do that here, that would be a huge milestone. For Emil Asentado, Jeff Siegel in that FXDD Ferrari, one of Siegel's first professional race wins was right here at Homestead in a Ferrari. So you were talking about Emil Asentado and Siegel winning here together. Well, one of Jeff's first wins was right here in a Ferrari. They're trying to do the same thing. I'm watching the weather as it comes down here. Water just gathering, even pit road now, very treacherous in what's known as the fast lane, probably two or three inches of water. So if and when we go back to green, it's gonna be a wild one. So we are coming to the green. The Nissan GTR pace car has pulled on to pit road and we will go racing. The 70 is coming back onto pit road. Jonathan Bomarito is bringing that Mazda RX-8 back to the pit box. No windshield wiper on on that car when he pulled it in too. I don't think that's the reason why though. 
All right, you've got two guys who know the conditions very, very well, but Ricky Taylor does not. However, he's pretty aggressive on the inside in the SunTrust machine. Yeah, he's looking for his way through there. They see Enzo again twitching through that puddled area through turn one. Oh, oh, Westbrook oh, gets yeah. to Westbrook. Ain't sure Westbrook was already sliding. Taylor to the front. How about that? Both Westbrook and Podolikio got loose. Westbrook's going to be stuck unless he really can get some traction getting out of there. Couldn't quite tell if Richard was already sideways and losing the car, but there may have been some contact after that moment. And remember, these guys didn't pit. They're on worn, wet weather tires. Ricky's got some fresh, <laughs> wet <laughs> continental really tires. Good job right there to get back to oh, the good. We're all good. Get going. Heard Westy there saying he didn't need to do that, meaning he thinks he got helped around. Let's take a look at that because I think he got helped around too. Watch Westy slow up though. Here we come down into turn one. Watch the puddled area there. And then as we get down in that next area. Yeah, he got him. He got in a little bit too deep. Yeah, the plane was definitely on Enzo there. Just got in a little bit too deep. A little over optimistic there. Thought he may have been able to execute that move on the inside. Here Westy go full throttle there, trying to continue the spin around to get the nose back toward the front. Ooh, that's Look at that. <laughs> that's Imagine what it's driving like. in that, folks, at about 150 miles an hour down the straightaway. That's what it looked like for Tom Wall in the 40, who's running second in the GT class at the moment. Westbrook is up and running again, and we understand that Enzo Podolicchio is going to be penalised for that contact. Well, we've seen it before at the last race at Barber. There's a lot of controversy there about penalties, but you've got to be consistent, and Mark Raffoff said this week, Listen, if you take someone out and it was a mistake, or even if it was deliberate, there will be a stop and go as Ricky gets wide. So Enzo may be hitting pit lane, but he takes advantage of a little mistake there by Ricky Taylor. That area, Dorsey, is just treacherous. If you get too wide, get in that deep water, you have to wait on the race car. Absolutely. Enzo didn't do that on purpose, folks. I mean, it was a mistake that he made, but it did cause the spin. I applaud the fact that we are going to have continuity, and if you take a guy around, you take a guy around. And regardless. I'm sure the SunTrust team, Simon Hodgson, team manager, Brian Pillar, the engineer, will be on the radio to Ricky saying, hey, he's going to get penalized. Don't try and chase him. No need to fight for this. You are still going to be the race leader. Quite get the uh, strategy here with the 8 and the 90, for that matter, and not taking that portion to make a pit stop. I mean, there's a long way for the finish. You wouldn't think the race was going to be called at that stage. Yes, track position is important, but you're going to run out of fuel sooner or later, even in these conditions. That was Tom Long in the 40. In fact, this is Tom Long as well, but you can't see up the passenger side. You can see to the left, though, he sees a little bit better than this. He is the leader currently in GT, which is pretty great, but he's also sixth overall right now. Doing a great job. Right till you turn right. You got to yes. look through yeah. the side of the windshield. One of the big talking points in the last few minutes, the last few laps, was that incident between Starworks and Spirit of Daytona. Let's go to Spirit of Daytona now. Well, Troy Bliss is the owner of the 90 car, which we just saw go around, and uh, obviously Troy not happy that the 8 car didn't come in there. But, Troy, the guys in the booth are wondering why you wouldn't take advantage of that last caution as we saw so many other prototypes come in pit lane. I mean, we're happy with the car. You know, the car's doing great. We've still got an hour and 45 minutes to go here, so it's really, um, we just, there was no reason for it. We've got plenty of fuel, plenty of tires, so we'll wait till we can bring him in, put Antonio in, and go to the end. But, you know, it is kind of disappointing. We raced those guys so clean, and, you know, it might have been a mistake or whatever, but, you know, it's not the time to do that right now, so. Looked like pretty light contact between the two cars. I assume everything's okay. Yeah, everything seems to be okay. There's a lot of track position puts us in jeopardy. We wanted to run up front. That's why we kind of let those guys do what they did at the beginning, and we didn't pressure them too hard. So, uh, I don't know. It's kind of disappointing, but uh, we'll get back up there. We've got a good race car, two good guys to get it back there. Well, Troy, Troy Fliss is quarterback, trying to go two in a row, right? Peter Barron, very unhappy with that call for Enzo Podolicchio, but I also had talked to them about strategy before the race. They said, we're going to stay out as long as we can, maintain track position if we are up front. If they were to call the race at some point in time, maybe we'll go ahead and win it without ever putting our other driver in. And if we're beyond 30 minutes from the point of that 245 mark, our other driver would go ahead and get points as well. It looks like that strategy is going to backfire. You may have noticed during Chris's report there, there was some pretty severe <laughs> contact between Lucas Law and Darren Law. Darren Law must be saying, well, am I the punching bag at the moment after Barber Motorsports Park? And now here, watch these boys go at it. This is through that area three and four, and uh, Lucas Law just punches it down to the inside. Darren said, you're not going to have it. Then they get into that next right hand, and it really gets crazy. Darren Law has been able to pull away. Here he is in the five, the Action Express Racing Corvette. He's able to get away from Lucas Law. So Darren is currently running second over Ricky Taylor. Lucas Law back in third. Scott Pruitt is fourth. And 
saw the splitter that time dig into that water as he got down to turn one. Clearly dropped all the way down into the water, and I think I might see damage to the front of the splitter. Now, what's okay there? Here's the eight car engine for the kill. Serving his penalty for the contact on the board of it. Good news is he's running towards the front of the pack, so he should still stay on the lead lap, which is obviously critical in this type of racing. This is the sister Starworks car, and it's the first race for that new Generation 3 Ford Riley. So Starworks have two of those cars. One of them is in the top three. A reminder about Car Warriors Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern on Speed. Two skilled shops go to war, transforming classic Chevy Novas into modern-day high-powered dragsters. It's Car Warriors Wednesday at 9 here on Speed. Quite a bit of fighting going on out here at Homestead Miami Speedway as we welcome you back, folks, to round three. Lee Diffie along with Calvin Fish, Dorsey Schrader, Chris Neville and Brian Tillis, the Grand Prix of Miami. And... It is one of the toughest races I've seen in Daytona prototype history as far as conditions and the way the guys are handling it. Drivers in both DP and GT are doing an outstanding job to be managing these conditions. We've seen a lot of cars go off track and they've been able to keep it going and get themselves back on track. What comes with that, though, is kind of peculiar to this racetrack. I raced back here for Rob Dyson in the can -Am car. And when we see those guys go off and we're saying it's mud, we see them come back on, it is not mud we're in Florida. It's sand. And what happens is that when that sand gets on the racetrack, it mixes with the water. When it goes into the windscreen and into the engine of the cars behind it, all that sand starts to stick throttles wide and it starts to start wearing on bearings. And he had to report that was, oh! Andy Lally! Spin there, right in the area that caught out John Potter. That was in second spot, closing in for the lead on the 59 machine, the Brumos Porsche that currently leads. So even the best in the business can get caught out in these conditions there. And just a few moments ago when we are in the break, have a look at this. This was Tom Long going for fourth overall. Yes, a GT car up there mixing it with the Daytona prototypes and got turned around by Darren Law. There goes the 59 of Andrew Davis for the lead of the class, and it was costly for Tom Long. He dropped about nine or ten positions. <laughs> How tough is it out there? Let's hear from one of the drivers who's just stepped from one of those Action Express cars. Uh, David Donahue just uh, climbed out, and, and you looked at me and said, it, it is crazy out there, and then you were just watching Darren's issues. Yeah, that's unfortunate. That, uh, the change in conditions are really what's getting you. When you're following someone, sometimes you can run in their wake, so to speak. Um, you go down into one and you essentially submarine under, so it really throws the car off. And going on the banking, there's a drop away, and that's what caught me caught me out almost every lap, but really bad once. So when guys go off and they bring all the mud and stuff back on, it's almost like they're they're pulling the bay back with them as well. So you just every time you go in, you never really know what you got. Every every other lap, it seems like it's a crapshoot. You guys have had plenty of contact. You got roughed up a little bit earlier. Well, yeah, the 99 car had the inside line, and I, I probably could have braked really hard and braked with him and held a position, but not in the wet. I mean, it, it only would have been really bad for me. And, and then when you get on the curbing or any of the painted areas, you have no grip whatsoever. So he got me on the curbing, and I basically had to sit there and idle until he was clear and I could get in the opening. And I think Lucas Lure got a piece of you as well. So it is rough out there from Corvette to Camaro, Chris. Well, Paul Edwards has one of the best batting averages here at Homestead Miami Speedway with three wins in GT. But, Paul, we're sitting here watching the broadcast. And now watching this, you just saw Andy Lally go around. Are you learning where not to be on the racetrack, or is it making you uneasy about having to put your helmet on? Yeah, I mean, every lap's a different lap. You know, I flip back and forth to the screens, and the track looks different the next lap. So you got to really take it one uh, corner at a time here. These Continentals are actually lifting a lot of water for us. They're actually doing a good job in this uh, heavy of conditions. It's amazing we're under green flag. Um, but the Camaro's up to fifth. George worked his way back. Uh, he had an early uh, spin, but he's uh, recovered well. The car seems to be working good, but he says every time he gets behind the car, he can't see anything because there's so much spray from the tires. But um, I had a couple laps this morning before the engine blew. And the guys did a phenomenal job getting a new engine back in in only an hour with the help of some Stevenson guys. So Camaro's uh, pushing for a good result here. Yeah, this team hoping they can be the first Camaro team to get a win this year. Look on Paul's face there when Chris asked him a couple of questions. It was like uh, all of the above. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's Everything. tough. Yes. 
these guys are running some pretty nifty uh, lap times as well. We've got a Porsche out in front with Andrew Davis, a Ferrari second with Jeff Siegel, and then Spencer Pompelli is going well. Rowan Bleakamol and Andy Lally on screen right now, so this could very much be a Porsche day. Yeah, very much so. There's two TRG Porsches with Bleakamol and Pompelli going to be a factor in this. You've got Andy Lally in the mix. I mean, this is going to be an exciting event. Look how easy. Oh, there's cars off everywhere there. Star Wars That's cars. Not leaky, I think. 42 is Dane Cameron. Is Dane Cameron? He's been doing a terrific job. He was up in the top five in class. Oh, and he can't get it spun around. This, this is always dangerous stuff. This morning, this race track always does it. Outside water entrance to the first year, then look at it. Always is a mess. And look at that. And all that sand stops coming on the racetrack. There's no problem coming to the He was really trying to get it spun around, but it just took off on him and went straight. He's got that long road back to the racetrack. He hasn't lost that many positions remarkably. Oh, Look man. at that. Yeah, that one needs a little uh, laundromat work. This is Enzo Podolicchio, championship leader, co-championship leader coming into this race. Pole sitter. You can't see it. Led the race early on. He's been involved in a couple of incidents, including this one, the most recent with Dane Cameron. I suspect that's all from the uh, Mazda. That when they went off together, I think he was the second car and he just got all of that. The story overall is Ricky Taylor is the race leader to the tune of 19 seconds. However, just one lap ago, he had a 22 second lead. Scott Pruitt took three seconds out of Ricky in one lap. We'll continue to oh, watch he's off again. That could be visibility, I'm not sure. Remember, this is our championship leader. Massive on, consequences in the board. points potentially. get Ryan saddled in I think yeah. Yeah. yeah time to bring Enzo in get the car cleaned up and send him back out again we mentioned about the TRG Porsches circulating very quickly in these tough conditions what's the team owner think I think he's happy right now when he looks at that leaderboard and see he's got two cars in uh, third and fourth right now Kevin you were telling us earlier that you're engineering the car this weekend and you came up with a great setup what did you get your cars to do so well uh, it's a combo of things uh, all four drivers had a ton of input we've had really good luck here um, we've got like 10 podiums here and I think three wins and uh, we just do a really serious rain setup on the car there's four or five things you can do to make the car just a lot better in the rain and all four drivers have been great all weekend and we got our these two guys are fantastic. They're turning the fastest lap in the race. We've still got a long ways to go. So I, I know you're not going to tell me the four or five things that you guys will do to the car, but what does the driver want out of the car? Grip, adhesion, soft, power down, you know, and uh, when he's in traffic, I mean, there's a lot of stuff. Even visibility, you know, uh, you know, it's not just about the car traction. So uh, we think we got a good shot, but we're not, we got a long way to go. So. Well, Kevin said his best track is Daytona, but this is second on the list. Brian? Uh, Intro Podolicchio has brought the number eight Starworks Ford in. Ryan Dial taking over, but see all the mud and dirt on the front of it. The problem is it's not just mud like you would think of at home. You reach down and grab this stuff. It's sand, it's silt, it's really, really fine. And that's going to go through that mesh screen and into the radiator. Overheating could be a big issue as Ryan Dial heads out on track. Starworks boys did a nice job there to get that service and cleaned and sent because we're still under green flag conditions and the rain continues to fall here in Miami. Some news away from the track. Two-time Daytona prototype champion Alex Gurney had a very special moment recently where he got to throw out the first pitch at the Detroit Tigers game. Why was Alex in Detroit? It was all part of a Grand Am Rolex Series promotional event. Just raising the awareness of the fact that Grand Am is coming to the Belle Isle circuit. That is just going to be fantastic. June 2, and the other good news is we're going to be live at 5 p.m. for that race. Look at that schedule, Dorsey. There are some tremendous racetracks we're about to visit for the remainder of this season. Fantastic. Hey, look at the dates, too. They're back to back to back, so these guys are going to be working hard going race to race. Don't June forget. is really busy there, including that one on July 1st. And our North American Endurance Championship, we kicked it off at the uh, Rolex 24 at Daytona, the six hours of the Glen, and the uh, Super Weekend at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, the three rounds of the North American Endurance Championship. We'll talk more about that when we get to those events.
Let's get you back to what's going on here. And Scott Pruitt is edging a little more time out of Ricky Taylor, our race leader, but he's still got a very comfortable margin in that SunTrust Corvette. 18 and a half seconds, our race leader enjoys over Scott Pruitt. Richard Westbrook, we understand, will be heading to pit road shortly. We're inside an hour and a half left in this race, which has had everything so far. But the one consistent thing, the rain is relentless. What you can see is the fact that Richard Westbrook has now done like an hour and 16 minutes on this fuel run indicates how much fuel you save in these conditions. Well, certainly some has been under yellow. That's a big save, but you're just off the throttle so much, you get tremendous fuel mileage. Watching Ricky Taylor work his way around this racetrack. How smooth he is, Calvin. You saw him not even get near the outside of the road in the exit there because everybody knows that deep water there will just pull you over. And this is a team that really needs, needs a result, Dorsey. It's been a disastrous start. They are so confident after the preseason testing, the roll before the shore uh, at Daytona, and then they had the, the early exit from the 24 hour race. In fact, the nine car with probably an electrical issue is rolled, uh, rolling to a stop. This rain plays havoc. I'm not just a driver on the race, but all of the electrical system just really, really suffer. And like I said, yeah, this is. Not just water here, it's mixed with, like Brian showed, sand and all kind of silk. This brings out our full course caution. That'll be the third one in the first one as a result of the car off. Exactly, the other have been weather related. So Joao Barbosa's Action Express Corvette comes to a grinding halt. Hey, speaking of Chevrolet Corvette, there is a very significant person on the grounds today from the company and he's standing by with Chris. That's right, Lee, Jim Campbell's head of motorsports for GM. And Jim, last night you were up in Richmond for the NASCAR race and you pick a great weekend to come to a Rolex race. Well, we were in Richmond last night, but I wouldn't have missed this race here. Uh, Chevy's racing all over the world today. Uh, I didn't want to miss this one. The Corvette prototypes are running. Camaros are in the GT class and I, I wanted to be here. How important was that win for all the Corvette fans back at Barber? Oh, uh, it was a big day. You know, we developed that prototype in about eight months. We had lots of Corvette customers, fan supporters, Chevy supporters there with us in Barber. And again, that win uh, was really a big moment. A lot of work went into it by all the Corvette prototype teams. Uh, here we are again, and uh, we're looking for a great effort today. It's really wild out there. Uh, we want to bring, bring a win home if we can. And we've got this North American Endurance Championship this year. How important is that to Chevrolet? Well, of course, Rolex is an amazing race. We didn't get off to a great start there. Uh, we got Watkins Glen coming up and then obviously Indy. So we can't wait. Uh, you know, that's important, uh, you know, mark for us. If we, if we can put uh, put a win on that one, that'd be great. Jim, great to have you here this weekend. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Yes, and while there is a Chevrolet Corvette leading overall with Ricky Taylor and the SunTrust machine, it's not such good news for another Corvette DP team. Let's find out what the latest is at Gaines Co Racing. Yeah, the Red Dragon, one of the best prepared cars out on the racetrack, that beautiful red Chevy Corvette in the garage area they talked on the scanner when it first came in they thought it was internal it was in the engine so they'll not be back out but guys one of the things i did want to show you while we had the time and the car was sitting here you're talking about the electronics getting the wet and how water and electricity don't mix well here are some of the systems on these cars the ecus they keep them running the systems right in here all these connectors if water comes in through these door seams gets in these connectors or gets in these ecus you can have those shorts that you guys were talking about well, once again, that's right where a passenger will sit. Hopefully that is sealed up to the extent that water's not running in there. But Calvin, you've done it. I've done it where you're driving and you look down on your feet and you're under three inches of water in the floorboard of the car. Every time you put the brake on, it runs up the dashboard. Every time you get the gas, it heads toward the back. That's right. I mean, it's a learning curve. I mean, uh, as we said, we haven't seen race conditions with this new current generation of DPs, so they'll learn a lot today. A serial tweeter is Juan Pablo Montoya, and yeah, it's obvious, still pouring here in Miami, but the race is on, and it's pretty cool. We are under caution again. This is to have the Action Express Chevrolet Corvette Daytona prototype rescued. That's why we are uh, just taking things at a slower pace, and our own speed centers, double A, Adam Alexander. <laughs> yes. We might need to get back tonight. I'm not sure. We might need to use both. I think there's too many planes flying out of Miami Airport at the moment, but double A, cross your fingers for us. We'll see. Next week on Speed, NASCAR Fast Friday is running, running wide open in Talladega. Yeah, you can strap in for six hours of live super speedway excitement can't get anywhere else don't miss it friday coverage from talladega starting at 2 p.m eastern and 
While we're away, let's bring you up to speed with a string of pit stops, including former race leader, the number 90 of Richard Westbrook on the right there. Yeah, routine stop. These boys were getting pretty low on fuel. They didn't take that first opportunity to pit. So now Antonio Garcia is behind the wheel. A little bit of take going on the rad there. Then the 60 is in. Trying to recover a little bit. Lost a little bit of ground early on. Oz Negri stays behind the wheel. A little fix on the windshield, as you can see, just trying to get that thing cleaned up for him. And here we have the two TRG Porsches in. Spencer Pumpelli in the 67. The 68 is your own Bleeker Molen. And this is his uh, first regular race. We didn't get to see him at uh, Barber Motorsports Park after a collision between the two team cars. 59 is in. That'll mean Andrew Davis is out. And the lanky Lee Keane is in. We start to that portion. Everybody else can get a good start. This one is soldiered on till now. Yeah, these guys theoretically, an hour 21 left in this race. They may be able to stretch. We're hearing the mileage is really huge with these uh, wet conditions. Maybe an hour and 15 to an hour and 30. I don't understand why the 01 and the 10 car didn't pit here because they know the other guys had to come. They needed a full fuel load. They needed half a fuel load and they would have maintained the lead position. So a little bit of a head scratcher on that one why the 10 and 01 didn't pit. Speaking of pits, we saw the spirit of Daytona machine there. Chris Neville standing by. Yeah, we saw Antonio Garcia get behind the wheel. And Troy, everybody's trying to figure out if they can make it from here. We got a little bit over an hour 20. Not as much fuel consumed on a day like today. Can you guys make it? We're going to be really close, really close. Uh, we, we're going to maybe try for it. We'll see how it goes. If uh, It matters if the rain, another front comes through or not. But uh, we'll, uh, we're going to push. You know, we're here to win. So uh, it'll be interesting. Are you going to need some yellow, or can you make it, or can you potentially make it if it stays green? I think we'll probably need some yellow, but uh, it might be all right. We'll see. Uh, we'll see how we go. We we might have something for him still. And we saw Richard Westbrook get out of the car. Richard, you were taken out earlier in the race, but you got the car back up to third. So obviously, the Spirit of Daytona Corvette's working well. Yeah, I mean, it was unfortunate on the restart. I'm sure he didn't intend to do it because it was there was so many uh, st so much standing water into turn one. Yeah, just before you get to turn two, right in the braking zone, and that's where he hit me. And uh, it's unfortunate because it looks like we were comfortable at that point, but I was on the warm tyres at the end, and they, they're really, even though it's very wet, they're wearing a lot around the banking. So by the last three laps, I was really happy to get the call to pit. <laughs> and with the uh, downpour that we're having right now, how hard are these conditions, even under caution? Well, I mean, you know, it makes uh, England look like the desert, this place. I mean, it's <laughs> unbelievable. I mean, I don't, I've never raced in such conditions like this. It took them a long time to bring the safety car out when it really came down. And, um, you know, but everyone's driving really well. Everyone's coping. It's, uh, it's tough out there, but it's, everyone's doing a really good job. Sounds like Troy Fliss is going to try and gamble and try and make it, uh, make it from here. Bit of a stretch, an hour and 19 to go. We will see. Turner Motorsports have had a pretty interesting day. Bill Orblin is their highest placed car. Billy sits uh, sixth at the moment in class in the 94. And a regular co-driver of his and a, a family member at Turner Motorsport, we would be remiss if we didn't mention today, young American Joey Hand, who raced the, his first official DTM race today in Hockenheim, Germany. He is the first American ever to be a full-time driver in the German Touring Car Championship. They had over 100,000 people at Hockenheim today. Joey did himself and BMW proud. He finished 13th out of 22 cars, but he was the second highest BMW, factory BMW. He made it through the first phase of qualifying, and all in all, a pretty good day. He did get turned around while running as high as seventh. So, Joey, from all of us here at Grand Am, well done, mate, and we wish you all the best next week and at Euro Speedway allows its ring. Brian? Andrew Davis just climbed out of the Brumos Porsche, and Andrew, a lot of people saying this is a Porsche kind of day here at Homestead because of the weather. How was it out there from your seat? Well, I'll tell you, I, it was exciting. It was a little bit of everything. I, I still can't believe uh, all the spins and offs I saw and contact. Uh, you know, the Porsche always shines in the wet. It shines wet or dry, but in the wet, the 911 is just a great chassis. There's other cars out there that are very quick too, so I'm not sure if this track suits us best, but the main thing was staying out of trouble. I didn't make any mistakes or go off, and I can't believe everybody I saw some guys catching me, then flying off, and other people running at each other and spinning off. It's treacherous out there and ever-changing. It's such a mental, uh, a mental exercise, not as physical in the wet, but mentally just very challenging. Obviously, the guys are talking about fuel mileage. You can't use as much throttle in the wet because of the slick conditions. That brings you fuel mileage back. An hour and 22 minutes to go. You guys good to go to the, to the checkers? I'm not sure. It depends on how many yellows there are. I mean, you can use just as much fuel if you want, but you end up backwards. <laughs> They're off in the dirt. 
So, uh, yeah, you've got to be conservative, which does help with fuel mileage. So hopefully we'll see. I, I think if there's enough yellows and the pace is slow enough, we probably could go an hour and 20 minutes, but that may be stretching it a bit. So it, long race left. Rumos may roll the dice as well. Good luck. And we wish our defending GT class champions well. The uh, 59 boys have had a good, strong run today. We know a lot of different people are watching this crazy race from Homestead Miami Speedway, including Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s crew chief from Hendrick Motorsports, Steve Latart. Steve, thanks for tuning in. I'm sure you wish you uh, weren't here calling strategy on this one, mate, but it's certainly an interesting one. Well done on Dale Jr.'s result last night as well. A lot of questions on that fuel mile, and it's really hard to get a read, Dorsey, because there's been a lot of yellow, different amounts of rain, different pace to the race. The more you're on the throttle and can stay wide open, obviously, you're burning fuel down. When it gets really wet, you're having to roll out of the power early into the corners. You can't get on the power as early off the corners. That saves a ton. So the engineers now, it's really just trying to look and see how they're consuming the fuel down this final run, potentially. We're going to stay under yellow because the rain has started coming really heavy again and uh, time for a break, I suppose. And as we head off to a break, one of those interesting things that Richard Westbrook said, all the guys are doing a good job out there in these trying conditions. We'll see how it works out for our top two, Taylor and Pruitt, when we come back. Speed's coverage of the Rolex Sports Car Series is brought to you by Acura. Acura, advance and by eHarmony.com, where first dates have a better chance of becoming something more. We're kind of hoping for a little something more here, but we're getting more of the same. And that is pretty hard rain. And as I mentioned earlier in the broadcast, we got here 7.45, 8 o'clock this morning, and it's pretty much been like this for the majority of the day, easing and then coming back harder, easing, coming back harder. So. It's been a tough one, Doss. I got here two days ago in the motorhome and stayed here all last night, and it hasn't stopped raining once. I guarantee you, it is a flood here. Big shout Homestead. out, big shout out, Doss, to our camera crew, our production crew, the guys and girls who are out there doing it tough and there still you. bringing us great images. Thank you very, very much for hanging in there. I know a bunch of you left the uh, TV compound with handkerchiefs and rags to try and keep your camera lenses uh, clear and clean and not fogged up, but it's such a hard task. The corner workers too, and that is a yeah. miserable day. They're out on the corners. They do a tremendous job, a lot of them, on the, and they're just volunteers essentially. And uh, to do it in these conditions, it's a long, long day. I said that yesterday. I mean, they're putting in 10-hour days where they're just sitting out in that corner, getting drenched the whole entire time, and they're doing it with no money pay whatsoever. They do it because they love the sport as we do. Just saw your GT class leading car there, Jeff Siegel in the FXDT Ferrari doing a really good job and they're uh, in a strong position to have back-to-back -back podiums. Oz Negri has been cutting before this last portion, was cutting some of the quickest laps of the race. However, he's dropped back and he's doing it tough. He's not on the lead lap, but he's trying to scramble and make up for lost ground. He and John Pugh know this place really, really well. Yes, this is the same driver, same car, same team, along with Justin Wilson and AJ Armendinger that went all the way to victory lane at the Rolex 24 at Daytona. This has been a golden occasion. Mike Shank Racing finally does it. And AJ Armendinger steers that Ford Riley to victory lane. It's been really great. Uh, the acknowledgement and the, the congratulations we got from people all over the world literally have been just kind of overwhelming, to be honest with you. I knew it was a big deal for the race, and we tried for nine years to win it, but uh, the response just blew me away, actually. I, uh, I, I took a week to, to let the thing sink in. Uh, then I went back to Brazil for uh, some media stuff. Well, I've been pinching myself a lot. It's, it's a, it was a great victory, great for the team. Took it all in, and now we really, we really got to prove something. Uh, it's amazing. It's what Mike Shank and I have worked so hard for for seven years, and you know, to be the 50th anniversary, the, the atmosphere of the race was was unbelievable, and the energy. So, uh, and the way we won it, we, we didn't just go out there and kind of get a lead and ride around. I mean, all of us, not just myself, but. Oswaldo Negri, Justin Wilson, John Pugh, all, all my teammates. We didn't put a wheel wrong for 24 hours. It was hard work to win Daytona. It is a lot harder to keep where we are now. So we just keep, we just need to work, work, and work, and work. And as, as a result of that wonderful accomplishment, Mike Shank has been made the unofficial mayor of Pataskala. He was also featured in the, in the Columbus magazine in Ohio, which uh, centers on celebrities of the area. Brian Till lives in Columbus. Brian, is he really a regional uh, celebrity? 
Yeah, he was on the cover of the magazine. He is a regional celebrity. I want you to know that we probably live 15 miles apart and uh, no, because I know you're going to ask. I have never been on the cover, so <laughs> I, I knew that's where you were going with that, Lee. But Mike Shank has, and and Mike, the guys were just looking at the Rolex 24. I think back to this team. I can remember racing with you back in in the late 80s, early 90s, and watching what you've built from a group of volunteers to winning the Rolex 24 and building this program. How special is this family to you now? I mean, it's, I don't know where to begin. It's absolutely gotten us where we today. I'm so grateful. We had such a great run at Daytona. We're having a little rough run here today, but uh, actually we have a real good car. We're real happy where we're at. We'll just get a lap back. But I think overall it has changed the landscape for us a ton. It's allowed us to look at doing the Indy 500 this year. It's got us a lot more respect among people, fans, manufacturers, and uh, I'm just eternally grateful to all the people here that uh, have stuck with me for 20 years, I guess. Yeah, you talk about the opportunity to run at the Indianapolis 500, and I know that would be huge for this organization. For you personally, there just seems to be one thing that's missing with that entry. You've got the car, you've got the crew, you have the experience, the expertise. You need the lump in the back. Yeah, you know, it's really a funny story. You finally put a driver and Jay Howard together. We have the car, the team, the budget. We have three really good partners we want to announce, but I cannot get a motor. So there's been a nice little groundswell of support on Twitter and Facebook that we're trying to get a Honda or Chevy to step up and help us. And uh, anything we can do from our fans' perspective, anything will help at this point. We want to be at the 500, but we literally have to know today. Yeah, I knew the deadline was coming. They're looking for today. They're also looking for another win in the Rolex Series today. A lot going on here at Mike Shank Racing, Lee. You talk about commitment, guys. This is a guy who mortgaged his house, the second mortgaged his house, had to go to his wife, wake up with her the next morning and say, everything we have is in that team that car. That takes a lot. I had to do it before. I mean, that, that is good. A lot of passion there with Mike. It was great to see that result. And uh, he so badly wants to break into that Indy 500. It'd be such a tragedy, really, if he couldn't make it this year. He says the car's to be on track at the Speedway on May 12th. That's a couple of weeks away, folks. And I'm sure tonight on Speed Center, Robin Miller will have an update on the race in Brazil and an update on what's coming up at the 500. But you know, come on, Honda. Come on, Chevrolet. Yeah. Get behind this guy. Give him a chance to go for the Indy 500 and the Rolex 24 all in the one year. Brian? Well, I think the thing that's special, guys, is Mike Shank has the 33rd entry for that event. And for those of you who are fans of the Indianapolis 500, you know how it's special and how important the number 33 is. It has been said before that 33 is not is a, just a number, but I got news for you. If you're one of the 33 who's ever attempted to make that race, one of 33 who's ever started it, or all the people who have tried and fail and some have literally given their lives, 33 is not just a number. Mike Shank has that 33rd entry if he can just get a power plant. This is a little American team that can. My gosh, they won the Daytona in 24 hours. I mean, they really know how to get a race car to the finish line and to do a win. So I, I hope, I pray they get that entry. We all do indeed. Switching gears from DP to GT, and a man who's still smiling from getting a podium in his new FXDD Ferrari at Barber a month ago is Emil Asentado. And Emil Asentado and Jeff Siegel won this race back in 2010. They went on to win the championship that, that year, leading the race today. Emil, obviously things going well. As hard as it's raining right now, you've got to be happy that your stint is over. We're pretty thrilled. I am thrilled to be out of the car. It's much more <laughs> fun spectating than driving today. That's hell out there right now. Jeff's doing a great job, fantastic job. And I don't know if you guys got it on TV, but when he went for the lead, there were three cars on top of each other, 59 car, 67 and 69 into turn one. I looked at the TV screen to see who came out first. There's a DP up on the TV screen. What are you guys thinking? Uh, you can't give us a hard time about that. We got two classes out there, but you guys opted to stay out on the racetrack when the caution came out. Other GT cars came in, fueled up. Can you make it if we stay yellow the rest of the way? If it stays yellow, we'll barely make it. If it goes green, we have to come in, which will be a problem, because we think the Porsches can make it to the end with their fuel uh, uh, mileage. Well, they could potentially lose a lot of track position because of that call. FXDD Ferrari leads. Dane Cameron and the Salem's Mazda team have turned things around dramatically. He sits second, and that Chevy Camaro for Stevenson with Robin Liddell behind the wheel is third. As you can see, conditions not getting any better and just over an hour left to run. Even though we haven't seen a lot of green flag racing, we know many of you are still with us. Thanks for watching and hanging in there with us on this 
Very bizarre day at Homestead Miami Speedway where rain has been the talking point. Tricky driving conditions right at the forefront of everybody's minds. They've been slipping and sliding and spinning everywhere. And some very good recoveries and saves, mind you, like Paul Dallalana here. Didn't lose any positions right there. He was running up in the top three. Then we see our leader, John Potter, in the GT class going for a little bit of a ride there. Just runs a little bit wide, Dorsey. Gets in that deep level. That corner there, the exit turn one, as you can see, has been really one of the worst parts. Porter gets a little help around. He was going for fourth place overall. That was past the position on a prototype. Tom Long, there he is, yeah. He had to uh, clear things up a little bit inside and use some homemade methods to do that. And then take a look at this, Enzo Podolicchio for the lead of the race. Just got a little over anxious and thought he may have been able to execute that move on Richard Westbrook and put him out in the mud. That earned a drive-through penalty. And Ricky Taylor put the SunTrust Corvette at the front of that field, courtesy of that collision, and has stayed there ever since. Leading Scott Pruitt and the five of Darren Law. The Continental Tire race recap here for the Grand Prix of Miami. It shows you how many cautions we've had for how many laps. Not all that many lead changes. And we should say that uh, here we're approaching 3 o'clock local time, 3 o'clock East Coast time, and Grand Am Road Race officials uh, are looking at things very carefully at the moment. The uh, Managing Director of Racing Operations, Mark Raffoff, at the top of the hour will make a call as to how the future of this race will be run here today. So they're looking closely at the weather radar, they're looking at track conditions, taking everything into consideration, and Cal in about within the next five to ten minutes they will make a decision on what, we, what the rest of the afternoon will look like. Yeah, they'll be looking at the current conditions on the track, how long before we could actually go racing again if it doesn't get any worse, looking at the radar. And this may explain, we talk about why did the 10 and the 01 stay out when everyone else is hitting pit lane under that last caution. Well, you talk about maintaining that track position. If the race does get called, you want to be leading. What I would have done for the 10 car, they had to stay out there because they wanted, they're leading the race. They don't want to give it up to Pruitt. But for the 01, as soon as Taylor stayed out, I would have ducked in and topped him up with fuel. If the race gets called short, it's a mute point, but otherwise, if it does go green, that would have put them in a really good position. Of course, these guys had no idea that, uh, you know, what, what kind of decision might be made. One thing about the weather down here in South Florida, I live down here, unlike the rest of the United States where it comes from the west, headed towards the east, and just gets out of here, down here, once you get this far south, is it runs in a spiral, it goes in a circle, it doesn't just go away. It sometimes takes a day or two to move these systems off. And that, in fact, is where we're at. What happens is it goes out in the ocean, the storm does, it gathers the water up from the ocean, it comes back around the backside, dumps the water on you. We've seen that now for how many days? A day and a half at least. They don't just go away down here. And a lot of resilient fans and workers here at Homestead Miami Speedway throughout the course of this weekend. That just shows you the picture. And we've been looking at similar images for the last 24 hours at least. It was a pretty testing race yesterday in the Continental Tire Sports Car Challenge Series as well. It really was. You can see the time lapse there at the, at the bottom of the screen as we look at that. So it really hasn't changed much. Well, one man who is uh, pretty charismatic and we see a lot of facial expressions and hand gestures from the pit box is the man who runs this operation, Wayne Taylor Racing, the man himself behind the SunTrust Corvette. Here he is with Chris. Yeah, and Wayne, it's been a tough beginning to the year. You had the engine problems at Daytona, the penalty at Barber, but if things stay the way they are right now, this is exactly what you guys need to turn things around. Yeah, when we were, when we were driving down here with Max and Ricky on the way down from home in Orlando, um, both of them at the same time said, what we need this weekend is to have rain. And of course, drivers never normally like rain, but um, we felt that it was going to be the best chance for us this weekend because we've obviously a little behind in the development considering the fact that we did 13 laps in uh, Daytona and then obviously in uh, in uh, Alabama, you know, we had a couple of issues there. So this would be nice. Well, I know you guys didn't come in to pit when the caution came out. So obviously maybe a little concerned about fuel. If it stays yellow, how long can you circulate? No, we'll be good. Pruitt and us will be good. Um, the only thing I hear the driver's talking about, especially Scott, is really complaining about the, um, the condition. So hopefully they'll do the right thing, you know, um, but I think it still has been a good race. Yeah, I've heard Scott complaining about the conditions on the racetrack, but pretty much Ricky Taylor's just telling him how comfortable the car is, the temperature inside. Brian? Well, the complaints at Starworks were earlier when the eight car had its contact, but Peter, when you look at the stable, two running really well right now. Lucas Lure has the number two machine up to fourth. That's got to be good news for you guys as you look forward to the rest of the season. I know you were a little upset by the eight, though. 
you know, it's it, it's a whole thing. Of, the series has to do what it can to uh, put on a show and and you know get a good television broadcast out there. But we we were complaining right from the start that you saw how many cars went off in turn two, and there was no you know we had contact in turn two because the 90 car went off and came back in front of a slow. Enzo got on the brakes. There's nothing he could do and just touch the guy. You know, it's that's not our fault. Penalize them for going off. So that's you know officiating up to them. I don't, you know, Enzo killed it out there. I mean, I, I think he did a good job humiliating a lot of pro drivers out there. So kudos to Enzo. Alex did an awesome job. He got up to fifth out there. You know, it, it's a shame though, because if they end this thing soon, we set ourselves up good with you know Lucas, who's a great pedaler in the rain with the other car. And uh, you know, we think we could have had something for the front cars. Our cars have been killer in the rain out here, and it's it's a shame that they stop it soon if they do. Yeah, you, they always want to do well down here at Starworks, and even though they got a top five finish going, guys, they're one of the few teams that want to see it stop early. So again, just repeating what we mentioned uh, when we came back from the last commercial break, in uh, the next few minutes, uh, Grand Am race officials will take a look at the big picture and make a decision, and we understand that that decision may be coming even sooner than what we thought. Uh, we've just received a message that the white flag will be displayed yeah, this, this time, time by. The lap after it. So the race will finish under caution. And I can tell you, just looking out the, the window of the announce booth here, just the conditions actually seem to be getting even worse. It, it is getting worse. If you look across the back straightaway, you see that fog coming in. That's where the ocean is over there. That always pushes this way. White flag, one lap to go. They're going to stop this early, and uh, I think that is the right decision in this case. Well, and that is a huge sigh of relief for this team here that only saw some 14 laps at the Rolex 24 at Daytona. It lasted less than half an hour. And for the Ferrari team, the FXDD boys from AIM Autosport, Emil Asentado and Jeff Siegel, former series champions, they've won here in a Mazda. This will be their first victory in a Ferrari, which will be outstanding. You know, Calvin, you and I have both been in this deluge driving thing. All you want in this condition is for it to stop. You know, you just want to get out of the car. It's mentally very taxing. Your eyeballs, you got to strain your eyes to see. Mentally, it's like doing four times or five times the work you ever would. Well, there's a handful of drivers right now who want it to stop. Yes. They're the ones with good track position. There's guys like Lucas Lur, like Ryan Dial. They do not want to see this thing stop because they feel they have really strong race cars, really good performing race cars. They wanted the opportunity either through strategy or just having a faster car to get back and get bigger points today. So this will have a big shakeup in the points here tonight. Ten car, they desperately needed this. It's been a disastrous start. What with the engine problems at Daytona, as Lee just mentioned, and then Max. Angelelli getting that stop and go penalty for the contact with Darren Lord Barber. This should get them back on track. It's been a funny year like that. The 10 front has scratched away back to 99 losing an engine today, and the rain is going to hurt them quite a lot. They're going to have to be in the same position now. If you're a Formula One fan, you will know all too well that there's been four different winners in the first four Grand Prix of the year. This is in Grand Am land will make three different winners in as many races in Daytona prototypes, which is just fantastic. The same goes in GT as well. So it's been a tremendous season of different winners and the competition has been tough. Today goes in a completely different basket for a whole range of reasons, but there will be people satisfied like that man there, former series champ, Jeff Siegel. Miami is home for him knows this area and track very, very well. So that'll be a special victory for him. And there hasn't been a Ferrari win in GT here in Rolex Series competition since way back in November of 2003, Brent Martini and Court Wagner. So it's been a long time for the prancing horse. It has, and uh, don't count out these boys for the championship. I mean, Jeff's certainly doing his job behind the wheel, but Emil is back on form. He loves this Ferrari. We saw him take the lead outright on his stint at Barber. Got the job done here today, up in the top five or six. So, AIM Autosport switching over from DPs has been a quick and very successful transition for that Canadian-based team. Sorry to see them leave the Daytona prototype ranks, but boy, they've really taken to this Ferrari very, very quickly. For all of these Generation 3 Daytona prototypes, all of them are very, very different to the way they started the year. There's been so much fine-tuning and amendments made on each and every car over the past three months. So the hard work has paid off for the SunTrust guys. They had to start last today, and Ricky Taylor and Max Angelelli will celebrate victory again today. It'll be the fifth series win for young Ricky. It'll be the 19th victory for Max Angelelli and they further forge their great relationship as a driving duo. SunTrust.
goes to victory lane Great in job, very Wilkie. damp conditions at Homestead Miami really Speedway in an abbreviated race, finishing under caution. And well done to AIM Autosport, the Canadian-based team, the FXDD boys, Emil Asentado and Jeff Siegel, victorious for the first time in their new Ferrari 458 Tuck Grand Am. Win in our GT, uh, There's career. Simon Hodgson, Brian Pillar, Wayne Taylor, the guys that run the show at Wayne Taylor Racing. Well done, boys. They've been working tirelessly over the last five months with this new car. So the hard work has paid off. Travis Hogue, the crew chief, good work, guys. We'll come back and hear from our victors. We'll try and dodge the rain the best we can. Speed's coverage of the Rolex Sports Car Series is presented on speed by Rolex, a crown for every achievement. Brought to you in part by Continental Tire, innovative technology, driving confidence, and by the new generation Honda Civic, to each their own. We thank you for being with us today here at Homestead Miami Speedway. The race has finished early if you've just joined us due to severe weather conditions. And for the top four finishers in the Daytona prototype ranks and overall, it's their respective best finishers of the year. Yeah, great run for those boys, but I tell you what, the cars that finished fifth and sixth, the 90 and the eight car, they'll be very disappointed just with the timing of the end of this race. And the 99 gains cope off Stallings machine out early with engine dramas. Let's take you to the Rolex move of the race. And it involves Richard Westbrook. Enzo Potalicchio slams the back of that 90. And through on the inside goes Ricky Taylor. Thank you very much. That's what a victory looks like. He stayed in front right there in the SunTrust Corvette right to the, to the checkered flag under a full course portion as we now know. Well, it's time to celebrate in a very different looking victory lane here at Homestead Miami Speedway. Brian? Uh, Ricky Taylor just climbed out. He still has his helmet on. He'll get that off. Max Angelelli has come over. And Max, for you guys, you led the most laps here last year. I know you've been working on the car since Barber, and you've made up for the Rolex 24. How sweet does this victory feel today? Very nice. Final, finally, you know, Wayne can leave me alone. And uh, <laughs> it can be a little bit relaxed, heat with uh, just relaxation and we are very happy the team did an amazing job good strategy good strategy in this and the car was just fantastic our corvette was perfect and ricky taylor perfect as well they switched up the driving order this weekend and ricky you said in one of the press releases the pressure is now on me there couldn't be any more pressure today in these weather conditions but you handled it yeah i mean i was sitting there and max had to start from the back and he did all the work really i mean getting all the way up to third and I had to get in the car in third. I mean, I, I was hoping at least, you know, the pressure would be off a little bit, you know, coming through the back, I'd, you know, take my time. But now he gave me the car right in the front. Inherited a couple of positions, and, uh, you know, the car was great. The team knew the weather was coming. And, uh, you know, I think they played the strategy according to that, and just awesome. I mean, Homestead, we've had, you know, such a monkey on our back, and great to finally, finally win here. That monkey is off their back. SunTrust back in victory lane, Lee. Yes, Ricky's dad, Wayne, won along with Max Angelelli several years ago. That's their first win uh, since Watkins Glen last year. Let's take a look at GT. How about that? Ferrari on top. What about the 42 Salens Mazda? Great result for Wayne Nonamaker and Dane Cameron. And then the Chevy Camaro of Robin Liddell and Ronnie Bremer on the podium. Ferrari, though, I have to say, Emil Asentado, Siegel, absolutely stunning, good win today. We walked, rode on board with him. It wasn't easy. You saw that car twitching around. They did a great job driving today. Let's yeah. hear from the boys in red. Well, Emil Asentado and Jeff Siegel, they did it back in 2010. And the Miami guy, you did it again this year. It's got to feel pretty good. You did it in a Mazda then. You did it in a Ferrari today. Yeah, it's absolutely fantastic uh, to get Ferrari its first win back in the Rolex Series, only our third race. It's uh, Absolutely spectacular. The team's worked so hard. Ferrari's worked so hard. The guys at Michelotto have given uh, a lot of time and hard work to us, and uh, Emil drove his butt off today. It was just uh, absolutely fantastic. Really treacherous at the end, but um, we got a lot of fun racing in. Uh, charged my way through the field and, and had some fun there, so um, you know I'm happy to get this one. Emil, this team was a Daytona prototype team. They transitioned into GT this year. Are you surprised how successful they've been thus far? The transition was seamless. They've done a fantastic job learning about the car. It's been a tough car to learn about. It's a street car made into a race car, so always has issues that they have to figure out. They've done a great job. Totally committed to it. Well, only three rounds in, but these guys are GT points leaders. Nice work to everybody involved with that FXDD Ferrari. Let's switch you to championship points in the GT class. And those boys we just heard from, 
former series champs go to the top by three points over John Potter and Andy Lally, who did lead, and another Porsche in third. This is a good tight championship, Cal. It really is. Ten drivers within nine points. It doesn't get much tighter than that, and everyone's going to ebb and flow throughout this championship year. Certain track will favour some of the marks, other tracks, the other drivers and teams, of course. Ryan Dial and Enzo Podlicchio came in as the points leader in DP, and how about this? Consistency counts for the, for the multi-time champs. Would you have predicted Ganassi to be on top here? I sure wouldn't have thought so, the way things are going. Nobody has taken this champion by the scruff championship by the scruff of the neck yet. Everybody's picking away at it, but that Ganassi team is consistent. Well, speaking of that Ganassi team, let's hear from Memo Rojas and Scott Pruitt right now. And Memo was in the car at the drop of the green, and uh, with all the cars together when the green flag came out, how congested was it? How difficult was visibility for you, Memo? Well, it was pretty tough because at the beginning of the race, we started to get the shield uh, foggy. But that was not the big problem. The big problem came uh, a few laps into the race. The, the windshield wiper broke and basically became almost zero. And that's when I started complaining to my team. Uh, I mean, I can't see. I mean, we had a quick car, but we just couldn't see when we catch GT traffic or, or, or slower cars ahead of us. So that was tough. And Scott, he's actually holding the windshield wiper in his hand right now. So it did just about as much good on the car okay. as it is right now. <laughs> You know, it's, uh, it was a great day for the Telmex BMW team, and I also need to applaud Grand Am. The conditions got really rough, and you just couldn't keep the car going in a straight line. I know it's not good for the fans. It's, it was a horrible day all the way around, but um, good we came away from here with what we got. A lot less equipment got tore up. Good day for the team, and uh, hopefully we'll get this windshield wiper <laughs> worked out. Consistency is what wins championships, and that's what Ganassi is working on right now, Chris. Well, the Salins group had two second places last year. They get their first second place this year. And, Dane, what a great drive by you guys. I mean, it was a handful of race. The visibility was about impossible. But, I mean, this one goes for the team. It's just absolutely miserable conditions, not only for us, but for them. And they did a fantastic job in pit lane all day. So big thank you to the Salins team. Great job by Wayne here in his opening stint. I mean, a really big team effort to get this result. So extremely happy and a really good start to the first half of our year. Yeah, this has always been a great track for Mazda. Good, good, good finish today. Thanks, Chris. And there's an old saying that says, cars are cool, but the drivers are the heroes. And the drivers really were heroes today. They were, and certainly the team had to uh, back these guys up in pit lane. Some great calls by the teams that won here today in terms of recognizing this race may be called short. Dorsey being in the right track position to be there when the checkered flag did fall. But uh, the drivers were really on their toes. The conditions were changing. The visibility was changing. You saw Mamo dealing with a broken windshield wiper, fogging up windshield. You can see it right there on the winning car. Tough, tough day. And the teams did their job as well. This is the first time for these Generation 3 cars to run in the rain, first time for this rain tire to be in the rain. You know, a lot of unknowns. Everything went pretty smooth considering treacherous conditions here today. And the speed executives and producers are being very kind to us. They're not going to make us fill for the next 15 minutes <laughs> or 45 minutes. Coming up next, we have highlights of a pretty exciting race from a month ago from Barber Motorsports Park in Birmingham, Alabama. That will get you through right to the top of the hour where V8 Supercars from Hamilton, New Zealand is coming up. But right now, we're going to take you back a month ago to Barber Motorsports Park in Birmingham, Alabama. Again, if you've just turned on this race here at Homestead Miami Speedway, called short due to severe weather conditions. It was a crazy old day, but some new winners and some new championship leaders. This series continues to impress and is always unpredictable. Thanks for being with us on a pretty bizarre day, and we look forward to seeing you at New Jersey Motorsports Park in two weeks. You've been watching Sports Cars on Speed.